The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm just watching that opener. I just said to Trey, we got to get a new opener. Uh, I don't look anything like that anymore. This, the, you know how they have the presidents and how they show how they age when they're in office? This is, this, was a, this is me aging in office. It's the equivalent of eight years, you guys. I look substantially different. Uh, in any case, uh, I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're coming to you live this morning. You know, a lot of times on Wednesdays we pre-tape, or on Mondays, excuse me, I know what day it is, uh, we pre-tape on Thursday to do a Monday show, and because of Halloween, we did not do that, and we were excited to bring you a live show this morning, so we are 100% live, and we got a big, big show. I was saying to Trayvon, we have enough stuff to cover for seven hours, so we're going to shoehorn it all into an hour, um, but we want to let you know that the whole hour is meant to be interactive. Traven is going to show you some of the different ways that you can connect with us. I'm going to remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. Uh, lots to do on that page, but the toy guide is live. So the 2019, if you want to check out what we thought and what parents thought and what individuals on the spectrum, and we had people ages two all the way up through uh, adults that were with us looking at and playing with the toys and giving us their feedback. We had therapists there. So um, let us know uh, what you think of the toy guide and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be thrilled to talk, be talking about that over the next month and a half. Um, so much has happened since we were here on Friday, seriously. Uh, so much has happened. Last night we were at the Ed Asner, uh, it was his 90th birthday celebration, all a benefit for the Ed Asner Family Center. And oh my gosh, we have so much to unpack about that. It was really an incredible evening and uh, star studded. We had a really wonderful time. I, you know, just highlights for me, I did get to meet the fabulous Cloris Leachman, and she was hilarious and wonderful and fabulous, but she is about three days older than dirt. And, you know, not meaning to be disrespectful, but I'm so grateful that I got a chance to meet her because uh, the woman is, you know, she's up there in years. And, and Ed was turning 90, okay? And Cloris is older than him, so there was that. Um, but some really incredible people there to support all of them. We're going to talk a little bit more about that if we have time. Maybe not even today, but, um, you know, perhaps uh, the rest of the week. Um, m one of my favorite moments was when Maureen McCormick, um, I said, I, you know, I said to her, we've been watching you come down the red carpet and, you know, we've been saying Marsha, Marsha, Marsha for the last half hour. And so she said to me, Shannon, 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 like as a thing to say, see how ridiculous that is. But I loved it. You know, like, I was like, yeah, that made my whole day, Maureen. So there we go. She's really lovely and her husband is lovely. Okay. So that happened, but I also don't know if you happened to watch Bill Maher on Friday night. His show is on HBO. And he opened a conversation that um, it's, we're, we're going to have to unpack and it's going to take some time to unpack. But um, I want to say this, 
first and foremost, that I, I always say this before I say anything, that uh, if anyone um, calls me an anti-vaxxer, I have lawyers who, who will address that with you because you're not allowed to say that because that is not the truth of who I am. Um, and, um, and no one on this show is um, saying that people should not vaccinate their children. Okay, that's the beginning and end of the conversation. However, uh, like Bill Maher and the expert that he had on the show, who was a pediatrician, were saying, and, and I, I agree with this, and you know, you don't have to agree with me, but um, it is important that we as citizens in a free country who have the free, uh, right of free speech to be able to ask questions. And I don't know about you, but anytime somebody says nothing to see here, nothing to see here, it's usually because, you know, there's stuff to see there. And we are allowed to ask questions about absolutely everything else, but in an environment where they are legislating and saying that parents don't have a choice, that they must vaccinate their children, then we must be allowed to ask questions. That is the beginning of the sentence, that is the middle of the sentence, and that is the end of the sentence. And I stand by that. If you disagree with me, I still love you, but that is where I'm coming from as a parent. We must be allowed to ask questions. We must be allowed to investigate. Studies must be done. We must be clear. And there's a lot more information about that. I urge you to watch what Bill Maher and his guests said. Um, I do not agree with everything that they said. I do not expect you to agree with everything you, they said, but I do think that we should all uh, agree on being able and legally allowed to ask questions. And I will say this uh, on the show, I hope uh, and pray for the health of Bill Maher because we have seen many times that when people make some of the statements that he made that, you know, I hope he's healthy and well and um, taken care of, you know what I'm saying, in a proper way so that he continues to be healthy. Because uh, we're going to watch closely to see how that all plays out. So lots to go on, and we're going to talk more about it this week. But we've got a big, big show for you, and I want to get right to it. Uh, Traven showed you some of the ways that you can connect with us, and so now let's get started. It is time, and you're not going to believe what our jargon of the day is, uh, it's, but that's what it's time for, jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one act, we try to figure out what are the experts talking about and how can it serve us. This was set in motion way before we saw who Bill Maher's guest was going to be on his show. Uh, so we're talking about biomedical intervention. This is, this is something that we talk a lot about on the show. People ask questions and say, what is that? So I set about looking for a definition for biomedical intervention. And what I could get a definition for was for biomedicine. So you're ready for what this, because this is how cutting edge we are for this. So biomedicine, the definition for biomedicine, and we took it right out of dictionary.com. It is, it's a noun. And it says, the application of the natural sciences, especially the biological and physiological sciences, to clinical medicine. And number two is the science concerned with the effects of the environment on the human body, especially environments associated with space travel. Um, and I find that really interesting because um, that second part is really the part that we're looking at for autism, but not having to do with space travel. We're looking at the environment here on the earth and how it affects our children and looking at them as a whole person. Somebody was saying to me last night at the Ed Asner um, thing about um, some regimen that they were doing, that they were taking something at a specific time and they were like, I don't know, but you know, it's working for me, I feel better. And I said, well, you know, it stands to reason that everything you put in your mouth has an effect. Like there's a cause and effect. You drink water, it has an effect on your body. You don't drink water, it has an effect on your body. So anything you take in to your body has an effect on you as a person and you are an organism, you're living, breathing, and there's, you know, something different for everyone. And and how I drink water may affect me in a different way than how you drink water, right? Because we are individual people. So let's take a look at our um, our working definition so that we um, get a better idea. It's treating the entire individual through means such as diet, environment, medicine, etc. So when we're talking about this with a person who's on the autism spectrum, we see a lot of times that doctors uh, look at a person on the autism spectrum and they sort of go, they tick the box and they go, autism 
and then it's like some mystery land, like you're not allowed to have a cold, you're not allowed, allowed to have something separate from autism, it's just everything is autism, right? I, I remember very distinctly when my son was four and he had the flu and there was a boy in his class who also had the exact same flu, but he was not on the autism spectrum. We both went to the emergency room within the same 24 hour period where the same doctor was there and treating and the boy who did not have autism, they gave him fluids by IV. My son, when they saw that he had autism, they did not do that. They sent us home. And later, you know, when I went back and got that doctor for something else, and I said, why was that? And he said, oh, I just assumed that your son wouldn't be able to take an IV. So he did not get the treatment. And the other boy was back at school two days later, and my son was out for 21 days. So I just don't, when people say that it's not equal and even, I'm with them on this, right? Um, so I want my child, I want myself to be treated as a whole person. I want to go to the doctor and not have them just go, oh, okay, you have a cough, I'm going to prescribe this antibiotic for you, right? I want a doctor who says, well, when did the cough, when did the cough start? Um, you know, like there have been all these fires here in Southern California. How much do you feel, like how much have you been outside? Were you exercising outside during the fire? Like to look at what it is, not just slap a medicine on it. But by the way, sometimes medicine is really the ticket, right? But it's looking at the whole person. You know, if you ever watched House and how House was like an investigative doctor and he would look at well, what's really causing the problem. Um, so sometimes you have naturopaths, sometimes you have chiropractors, sometimes, uh, you know, there's um, acupuncture, all these different kinds of things because different things work for different people. But um, biomedical intervention for autism usually means that we're going to look at uh, the child's uh, nervous system. We're going to look to make sure they're not having seizures. We're going to look to see that they're sleeping properly, that they're breathing properly, that their health and well-being is okay, that we're going to look at their blood and see, you know, is there, is there anything that's high or low? Um, and then we're going to treat that individually. And that might mean treating through diet. There might be certain things we take out of the diet, certain things we add into the diet. It might be a uh, medical intervention. It might mean changing their environment a little bit so that they aren't by a pet that's causing allergies, um, that we're not living directly next to one of those towers that, you know, you can light up a light bulb uh, by just holding up your hand, right? Um, so biomedical intervention is looking at all of those things, looking at the whole person. Now, how, how brilliant is this? Because when you see the people that are on our show, you're going to see how this really works, to, but it was really kismet. Okay, so uh, that's biomedical intervention. A lot of us have found with our kiddos that there are certain things that work for our kiddo. Not the whole thing. I do not believe in taking the whole of biomedical and throwing it at our kids, but there's very specific kids. Look, we already know that there's not one form of autism. There's autisms. In fact, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders has been able to identify 17 distinct clusters of individuals with autism that where there are traits and, and different medical things that uh, seem to be in common and the way they learn, right? So, you know, maybe this group of kids benefits from a gluten-free, casein-free diet. They're still figuring that out, right? But this group doesn't. This group maybe uh, is a low oxalate diet works better for them. And for this one, uh, something that's a little bit more keto maybe works because they're having seizures. It's different for everybody. It is not one size fits all. So, uh, okay, moving on. Let's move on to our question of the day, which kind of goes along with all of this. Um, you're not going to like me for this because I'm going to ask you to put, put paid to this. What food makes you feel terrible after you eat it? It may taste good on the way in, but it does not feel good. And maybe it doesn't feel good. Maybe you get acid reflux. Oh, my gosh. Last night I had this fabulous kale and chickpea, wonderful, healthy thing, but I have had acid reflux ever since. Uh, I'm never going to be able to eat it again. It was great, but I feel terrible. It may be that your tummy hurts after you eat it. It may be that it's an intestinal thing, or it may be that it makes you grumpy. I am somebody who has a wheat intolerance. Um, uh, so when I eat wheat, I, and if I have any kind of an infraction, like, because there's infractions sometimes, I feel it. I am 
angry, inconsolably angry. And it's gotten to the point where I notice it certainly at this point in my life, but I didn't when I was a teenager and when I was in my 20s, but I would just be mad and angry and not even rational about it. And I would describe to people that I felt hot and it felt like there were bumps underneath my skin. Imagine being a kiddo and being nonverbal and feeling that way and not knowing what was causing it. I have been known to, if I have a weed infraction, I certainly uh, threw a tantrum or two in my life, right? Um, but I'm just basically a miserable person to be with when I've had wheat. Uh, we call it being a bubba witch. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I, and my face is hot and I get really red and I'm just inconsolable. Really the only thing for me to do is to take a Benadryl and get in the shower and go to bed because otherwise I'm not fit to be around other human beings. So, uh, you know, what is it that's making you feel terrible? What do you eat that you know you feel terrible? There's a whole host of things for me. Like, I love salty snacks, but I feel bad after I eat them. It's a really horrible thing. I had some pretzels the other day and I felt bad. And they were gluten-free pretzels, can I just say. So what makes you feel bad. I feel like the list for me is so long and it bums me out. Um, but I feel better when I don't eat those things. So tell us what, what food makes you feel terrible. Okay. And our topic today and this entire week, um, if you haven't guessed already, it's really treating the whole person, looking at all of ourselves as a whole entity, as our own living, breathing, ecosystem that stuff comes in and it and it goes out I mean that's the reality right of how we do and and what does it feel like and some of us have more delicate ecosystems than others certainly our kiddos who are on the autism spectrum do but if you are a parent of someone who's on the autism spectrum I'm gonna guess that you one of you um, probably has some of these issues as well because I'll never forget the Dan conference that I went to, and Dan doesn't exist anymore. Now it's morphed into something called MedMaps. But I was at a Dan conference when there was still Dan, and I was reporting for the radio show that I was hosting at the time. And at one point, um, I was in a room where they were lecturing about something, about the immune system and autism, and they were saying how they were finding these recurring things uh, that they're still investigating, but they said, I'm just curious, of the parents that are in this room, how, raise your hand if any of you have an autoimmune uh, issue. And I'd just been diagnosed with an auto, autoimmune issue. And so I raised my hand, but then I looked around and every other hand in the room was up. Come on now. Tell me that that doesn't have something to do with something. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm going to bring you some other singers in the choir that you're really going to enjoy today. So on the show, super spectacular show today, it's like the, the biomedical off the chart show. So, uh, Anita Lesko is going to be with us in just a few minutes and she is a wonderful self-advocate. She is a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Believe me, I have to pause when saying that. She's been one for over 30 years. She's a favorite here on the show. She's wonderful. And Anita is going to share with us some information about diabetes because she was like me, uh, diagnosed with diabetes recently and has been able to reverse her diabetes and, uh, through diet not through medical intervention. So I, I'm hanging on every word, right? So, so interested to talk with her about that and about what's going on with her. She is also an award-winning author, a motivational speaker, and was a guest speaker at the United Nations headquarters for World Autism Day on two, in 2017. So um, really excited to talk with her. She's been able to not only reverse her diabetes, but lose 55 pounds. So I'm hanging on every word she has to say. Thrilled about that. And then a little bit later on in the show, we have the wonderful Christina Adams, who's going to be with us. Those of you who watch the show know that I adore Christina Adams. She hosts our Autism and Beyond segment here on the show. She was the author, uh, is the author of the book, A Real Boy. And A Real Boy was the, the book that was given to me by a card family. And they said, you've got to read this. This is the path you have to follow. It is a very dated book in that it's about um, ABA and, uh, and the experience of ABA at a much different time than we have today, but it's still 
so worth reading and inspirational, uh, the intervention that she did at CARD with her son and, and what that was like. Well, she has a new book that is just out. I think on Friday was the day that it was officially out called Camel Crazy. And it's sort of the second half of the story that once she had gotten him caught up in terms of the things that he didn't learn, it became clear to her that there's another piece to this that was biomedical. And for her, it ends up being about camels. So her book, Camel Crazy, is out. We're going to talk with her about that. Plus, she had a pretty interesting article that a lot of people had conversations about and feelings, uh, including myself, uh, about when people call us mom. Uh, so I know you're like, well, I love being called mom, right? Well, let's wait and see what Christina has to say about that because it's a very specific time and very specific people who are calling us mom that's got her foot toots. So you're going to want to tune in for that. So that's what's happening on today's show. Plus you, write into us, tell us your thoughts, your questions, your concerns. Uh, we're very interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, so stick with us. We're going to be right back with Anita Lesko. Don't go anywhere. Hey, I'm Candace Cameron Bray. Tom Bergeron. You're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. You're watching Autism Live. neurodiversity in parents. One big happy family? We hope so. Anyway, what is neurodiversity? Everybody's talking a lot about it these days. Neurodiversity means that there's a view that people with autism just have a different way of being and they should be honored for that. And then parents oftentimes look at autism as a disability or a disorder and that can create some conflict. We sometimes throw up our hands, neurodiversity or neurodiversity. There can actually be some issues around this that we need to think about together. First of all, neurodiversity could be positive because it can create more of a kind of a sense of acceptance in society. Yes, these people have autism, they're just different. It could possibly help create a sense of self-esteem that's improved in people with autism. They just realize, okay, I'm not damaged, I'm not bad, whatever, I'm just different. So that could be useful. Um, on the downside, it could be an excuse to not give services to people with autism, to not have much empathy for their parents, and to not look at ways that they can be helped. And in many people that have autism, they do very well. Other people do not do well at all. They can't access services. They cannot enjoy their life. They're in pain. So it is important that we understand it's not just one issue. So how do we solve this when we look at neurodiversity? I think we have to look at it this way. It's kind of like when you have that big family dinner at Thanksgiving and everybody's around the table, you got your uncle, your aunt, your kids, your parents, everyone has an opinion. It doesn't necessarily mesh. And I think the way that we need to think about this is we need to respect each other's opinion because actually we need each other. We need to be allies on this. The outside world is a big place for people with autism spectrum disorders and their families. We have to remember we're one big, happy, dysfunctional family and we need to behave that way. We should respect each other, listen to each other, and we will all have a great time when it comes time to get together and celebrate the lives of people with autism. So thank you for joining us. We're here with The Future is Bright and we have a very special guest, Temple Grandin. Doctor, thank you for joining us. We're it's so good excited to, be here. to have you. Thank you. you. You just gave a great speech at the 46th annual conference here in Denver, Colorado, and we would love to take an opportunity to just ask you a couple of questions okay. about a hot topic for you now that is employment yep. and helping people with autism become gainfully employed and what we can do as they're growing up uh, you know, through the high school years and through those younger years, maybe before they're old enough to get a real job as you'd call it what's your advice for parents out there and what they can do with their kids today to help them the problem with autism is since they changed the guidelines for diagnosis in 2013 the spectrum has become extremely broad at one end of the spectrum you're going to have silicon valley programmers 
you know, really good artists, I mean, really talented people. And at the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have someone that's going to remain nonverbal with some very severe handicaps, and it's all got the same word. You see, if you diagnose a kid with dyslexia, you still have a fully verbal kid with normal intelligence, can't read. ADHD, you know, you've got the hyperactivity attention problems. It's a much narrower spectrum if someone is ADHD or they're um, dyslexic. Autism now, you've got this huge quagmire of a spectrum. And the only time I can give a specific recommendation across the whole spectrum is if a kid's two and a half or three with no speech, you must start early intervention, 20 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one teaching. Uh, there's various ABA and other methods that work, but you've got to start. You've got to start now. I can give you a canned answer. But once a child gets older, they're kind of going, merging into three different groups. What are the groups? Well, you're going to have a kid that's going to remain nonverbal with very severe handicaps. And some of the ones that look very low functioning actually have a locked-in syndrome with normal intelligence inside. Okay. Then you have a moderate group where you've got some speech, but it isn't really normal speech. Reading might be, you know, fourth grade level, sort of like that. And then you've got the high-end group where they often are really smart in one thing, like math okay. or art or maybe verbal, and then they have a deficit in another thing. And the education system puts too much emphasis on the deficits, not enough, build, not enough emphasis on building up the area of strength. Mm -hmm. If you've got a third grader that's good in math, let's give them harder math and let's introduce them to programming. Okay. Because that's something that could turn into a job. You know, the programs that are hot right now are C++ and JavaScript, Ruby and Python. The courses are free online. But the kid's not going to get interested in that unless you introduce it. And who should be doing that? How do you recognize that you've got a kid with, let's say, a great math capability or great All art right, capability? so the kid, you should give the kid the third grade math, he instantly learns it, let's get the fourth grade book out. Okay. Let's get the fifth grade book out. Let's get the sixth grade book out. If he can do the college book in third grade, fine, let him. Okay. Probably going to need special ed. So very it. early. Oh, yeah. Don't make him do baby math. He's going to get bored, and I guarantee you he'll be a gigantic behavior problem when he's bored. It, it sounds like you think there might be a little bit of a coddling issue where parents are concerned. Oh, I think there's a big coddling issue on just learning things like reading. I'm really appalled at meetings where um, come to a meeting. Here is a 12-year-old that's completely and fully verbal that does not have to shake hands. He doesn't know how to greet. You see, the manners in the 50s were taught in a much more structured way. Right. And teachable moments were used. Like if I picked up my potatoes uh, with my hand, and I'm not French fries, but mashed potatoes with my hand, mother would say, use the fork. Okay. She didn't scream no. She'd say, use the fork. That's a teachable Healthy moment. Healthy alternative. And, and um, I was at a very fancy dinner one time at a college, and there was a 12-year-old kid there, fully verbal, and the... Um, uh, he started to eat the food with his hands, and I just said, this is a fancy dinner. You're not eating like that in front of me. You use the utensils, and he did. So it's I just, just gave the instruction. But you give the instruction. I didn't yell at him. You give the instruction. But there's a tendency to overprotect. I'm seeing too many fully verbal kids who don't know how to shop. Sure. Uh, they're not doing any chores in the home. Just basic things, greeting people. When I was eight years old, mother had me at party hostess at her parties. And I had to greet the guests and serve the snacks. So it sounds like your mother had a lot of faith in your ability to just take those tasks that she was giving you and do them. Well, and she you're saying just, you got to stretch these kids. Stretch you see, them. the kids okay. getting labeled autistic, the babying them. And and uh, you know, if you have a little kid, you know that's uh, you know severe behaviors. I was severe behaviors when I was three years old. Sure. You know, of course, the parents are gonna be upset about that. But then you got another kind of kid, ten years old, no friends, geeky and nerdy, gets a label and not enough is being done to engage his area of strength sure. and teach him basic skills. Because what makes me crazy is I go back and forth between different silos. I'll do a talk out at Silicon Valley. You can go to the big tech companies. It's Asperger's everywhere, cube okay. after cube full of them. <laughs> Headphones okay. clamped on, don't even look up at you. I can go over to the meatpacking plants. There's a whole shop full of hippies there, and I know they're on the spectrum. Okay. They've been there for years. This is what makes me crazy when I go out in the cattle world or the tech world or even the academic world and I find um, uh, older people my age, maybe 10 years old, uh, that are on the spectrum, but they're okay. not diagnosed. So it sounds like you're saying in today's society, less helicopter parenting That's right. and more, you know, you must do this and, and reinforcing, these are the manners you need, this is how well, we you are. just treat them. You've got to move them just outside the comfort zone. I, I just met okay. a lady when I was down in Argentina. She says, well, I can only shop at this one supermarket. There's only one newsstand. I can't go to another store. You know what I did with her? We watched out of that somewhere. meeting, and we went to a new newsstand. So and I brought through. her up to it, 
And I'm, I said, buy that magazine there. She wrung her hands a little bit, and she bought it. Okay. You so know, you made someone else walk through the proverbial I did. door. Good for That's you. Right. That's what I did. I did that last week. And you're encouraging parents to do the same thing with their kids And then now. we're going to be getting into looking at the job front. Okay, now that's something you just gave a great speech about. And it sounds like that's this new hot topic for you about how kids in their maybe early teens, maybe before they're really able to get formal jobs, should be out doing maybe the paper route type equivalent. Okay, we don't have paper routes anymore. In fact, I got asked the equivalent. I got asked the other day what a paper route is. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. And I, I said, well, you know, they used to have children <laughs> deliver newspapers to people's sure. houses. And that taught really valuable skills. Okay. Okay, now we don't have that today. So How what's about the equivalent? walking some dogs for the neighbors? You can do that in the city. Okay. You know, but not your own dogs, somebody else's dogs. And you got to go over that two different apartments at 6 o'clock in the morning, take those dogs out and walk them every day, even when the weather's nasty. Or maybe, um, uh, working in the farmer's market okay we were just discussing uh, new york city where my mother lives when i stay at the hotel in new york and i walk six blocks to my mother's apartment i go by, by five or six street vendors okay. okay a kid that's like 12 or 13 years old have them help out a street vendor they've got to start learning work skills if they're out in the suburbs they could help sure. out in the farmer's market okay. let's start getting creative uh, let's start off with church and synagogue jobs things like that church ushers setting up chairs for the church social mm -hmm. yes it's a job every thursday night you got to do those chairs so it's the accountability being somewhere where someone's expecting you to help out and do a particular so thing it's a defined task you got a okay. hundred chairs to put up defined and you got a hundred chairs you're gonna have to put away after the event is over so defined and repetitive and something that they do well in, in a lot of jobs the the newspaper routes are repetitive but let's go through my work history these okay. kids have got to learn work skills outside the home before they graduate my school. All right. When I was 13, mother just in the neighborhood found a little seamstress that uh, did dressmaking out of her home. And she went in and told about me. I was kind of different, sure. and, but I was really good at hand sewing. So the lady started having me hand sew the hems and take apart dresses. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Okay. Then when I got a little bit older, I was making signs and selling them. And the first sign I ever made was for a beauty shop. Um, First sign I ever made for a customer. I had made some other signs before okay. that. But making things, and you have to learn how to make signs that other people want. And then even when I was getting my master's, I was making signs so for letting, Carnival. Letting and then my kids. aunt's ranch. At my aunt's ranch, there was some work stuff. I had to take guests out on trail rides, and I had okay. to do some, she had guests there. I had to wait so on tables there, too. you were accountable. You were given yep. various tasks, and you were accountable. It sounds like that you're endorsing that we have our kids go out there when they're younger and do these you know, smaller jobs for people in the neighborhood or small business owners and learn those skills before they get okay, to the job Okay, now some states age. you can work in, safe retail at 14. Okay. Okay, a lot of other states at 16. Well, you know, let's say you got a friend of two blocks away, like a little tax accounting office. Sure, sure. They can put the kid to work in there. Perfect. You know, eh, you know cash economy. Something. They've got to learn work skills. And look, just look at the things in there. Maybe it's a little snow, a little Something. coffee stand that's in the neighborhood. And the kid, when he's 12, can go help out with that. And he's expected there at certain hours every week. It's a job. Okay. And so that's the importance of it all is just they to get them out there. They have got to learn how to work. And when I was uh, 14, I got kicked out of school for fighting and throwing a book. Went to a very expensive boarding school. Spent three years of that time running off the horse barn and cleaning horse stalls. And what Mr. Patey, the headmaster, realized, I was learning job skills. That was super important. Which and then when I finally got interested in science and studying, I kind of did a year of high school in a year. Okay. But I had took, but I, from working in the horse barn, I had learned that the responsibility. Every afternoon, you had to clean every stall, put yep. them in and out, feed them. So it's responsibility. Have our That's parents right. allow their kids to get out there and just not be afraid to do it before They've they get. They've got to get out. Okay. And the project search research is shown very clearly that working in a real job the whole year before they graduate from high school is very, very important for, for, for keeping employment uh, after they graduate. Okay, so along those same lines, now you've got a group of kids in today's society who have gotten out there and, let's say, worked at these little carts or s local small businesses informally while yeah. they're younger, and they get older and they're able to get into the workforce. They need to get there. you got to get to your job. So you have to be able to drive if you can, if you're capable of driving. Talk to us about your stance on well, driving. Well, driving was essential for me. I would have never been able to go into the cattle industry 
without driving. There's a scene in the movie where I get kicked out of Scottsdale Feed Yard. I was yep. driving. It was beautiful. If I hadn't have been driving, <laughs> I wouldn't have gone to Scottsdale Feed Yard and get kicked out of it. Yep. And so how did I learn to drive? How? On my aunt's ranch, it, we were three miles to go up to the mailbox and three miles back. And she started having me drive up to the mailbox on a dirt road. Well, over the whole summer, that was six miles a day, six days a week, I put 200 miles on that truck driving just on this dirt road. Just to pick up the mail. Just to pick up the mail. <laughs> That's what we had to do. That's the way okay. it was on the ranch. The mailbox was three miles away. Okay. So that was 200 miles of driving. That's a tank of gas. And I hadn't been near any serious traffic at that point. Okay. I'm, I think what you need to be doing is burning up a tank of gas in a totally safe place. Country dirt roads, giant big deserted parking lots, or open dry flat fields. Because there are some multitasking issues, and what the kid needs to do is he's got to learn how to operate that car before we go near any traffic. And the problem with driver's ed is they put them into traffic too fast. Mm -hmm. So I want to burn up this tank of gas in a totally safe place, then you do the driver's ed. Okay. So they fully learn how to steer, brake, stop. You can practice parking, practice all kinds of stuff, because this deals with the problems with executive function and multitasking. See, when you learn a motor skill like driving, you first of all have to think about how to steer, how to brake, and how to use the gas. Mm -hmm. Now, as you practice it, you no longer have to think about it. It just goes in your motor cortex. Sure. Well, before we go near any traffic, I want operation of the car migrated into the motor cortex of the brain. So once that's second nature, and a, and a kid goes out there and is learning how to drive on, let's say, this deserted road yeah, or this open right. parking lot, and they've got steering down, and you want to maybe throw some things into the mix before they ever go into driver's ed, like, it's raining, there's windshield wipers, and you need to look at your turn signal, and oh, by the way, you're about to park, those types of well, things. Well, then you start teaching them how to use the turn signals. Teach them everything. You just teach them everything, and and um, and then even after I got a car, I went to Franklin Pierce College, but that was on out in the country. There was some traffic, but it was really mild traffic. So I was another year on easy roads before I did any really serious traffic. Also, um, like downtown Denver, I just absolutely hate coming here. I actually avoid the rush hour, but you see the airport route, I know exactly where the lanes are, where I have okay. to get over. It's a more comfortable route. Uh, the airport's totally comfortable. Okay. You know, so like going to the airport's easy. And see, all my agricultural jobs were out in the country. So sure. But, but even on Denver traffic, okay, I would learn a certain route. There's some really bad exits where you can get forced off. Yep. Well, then I gotta learn where I gotta get over when I've learned the route. Um, but it's just gonna take longer. So okay. I'm recommending a tank of gas uh, in a totally safe place before we do any driver's ed, a year on easy roads before okay. we do downtown traffic or crowded freeways. Uh, just a period of acclimation. It That's like. right. Okay. It's going to take longer. For multitasking, skills in general, whether it's driving well, or... multitasking is the problem. You see, and the way to avoid the multitasking is there's no multitasking if the, the operation of the car is migrated out of frontal cortex back to the motor sure. cortex. So you don't have to think about driving the car. So you and want that extra time. That's right. And then okay. turn signals. Well, you can practice that on even on my aunt's ranch where the, we would go up to the mailbox. There was one turn to the mailbox mm -hmm. where I could practice a turn signal. Okay. Okay, so that's driving. That's now, right. Now, they can get to the job. They've learned how to drive. They've had their practice at, at manners at a young age and doing some of these informal jobs. Do you have specific advice for what we can tell adults with autism who feel like they've got the right skills to get Let's out into the Let's short circuit the interview process. Okay. Because when we were just talking about this at the tech conference I was just sure. at across the street with special assistant that... Um, company, a, a tech company that hires people on the autism spectrum, and they were talking about how they got to short circuit the interview process, and and the way that I would do interviews is I simply showed off my portfolio. I'd show okay. pictures of things I designed, drawings, okay, if it's a programmer, he needs to show a computer in there, here's, okay, here's some C++ that code and it does this, and I got some JavaScript and it does this, and you just show off your portfolio. So maybe a different kind of interview That's process right. for people That's on right. the spectrum. And then once they get on the job, the thing employers have to realize is you cannot be vague. There's a okay. scene in the movie where my boss slammed down the deodorant and said, you stink, use it. That happened. Right. They got to clean up themselves. And I did it. And that boss, I'm pretty sure, was on the spectrum. But you that said you that. appreciated that. Now, I was, was very direct. angry at the time. I was very angry and upset at the time. Okay. But I wanted the job. 
I thank that boss now, and I thank Linda Carpenter and her other secretary friend that took me out to buy the clothes. Okay. So are there things that you would recommend to employers that they can do to be more receptive to people a with autism? A lot of people on the spectrum are going to need a quiet place to work. Okay. You know, some of these restrooms have these horrible Dyson blade sure. air hand dryers. Now, if my office cube was next to that, I wouldn't be able to work. I've got I to, wouldn't either. I've got to get away from <laughs> that. And a and, uh, quiet place to work. Also, clearly define the tasks. Okay. Even now, I mean, I'm, I, when I do consulting, I've worked on a big manuscript with 15 other people. And I just said, I need homework. Okay, tell me I'll write this part of the manuscript, and I'll do it in this format, get it done on this date. Okay. Then, when I read through all the rest of the manuscript, I found some technical errors. You know, some things, there might be opinion. Mm -hmm. These were purely technical errors. Another person went, corrected them, no track changes, just sent it on in. Okay. Because you don't rub the other person's nose in their mistakes. Well, that's I got in trouble for doing something. That's like that. good practice anyway. Yeah. That's just nice, nice, uh, you know, social skills. Uh, so it sounds like then to just recap it for for employers today to clearly define tasks for people on the that's spectrum right. who are coming into the workplace. That's a great way to be sensitive. All right. To let's say it's, them a, succeed. it's programming. You don't just say develop new software. That's too vague. Right. They've got to write be some direct. code that does. You don't tell them how to write the code. That's up to the to the, the ASPE to do that. But what is the outcome? Okay. That's go on a certain platform, be a certain language, sure. and it's got to achieve a certain outcome. Great. And there's some deadlines. Great. And deadlines. Okay. Well, when I worked for the magazine, the deadline was so many column inches by the fifteenth of each month. And, and I was to cover a wide variety of livestock topics. Well, I think that that's great advice for, for employers out there because it's been a big question. And I, I know we, we're out of time. We have to wrap up. But it's been great to talk to you about just the employment issue in general. My advice to employers as an attorney would be give them a quiet place. Give them the well-defined well, one task. other issue I want to talk about, and that's What's the that? video game addictions. I'm seeing way too many kids where uh, moms are coming to me. He says, he's 21, I can't get him out of the basement. He's okay. 18, I can't get him out of the bedroom. Uh, we've got to limit the video game playing. Well, I think all parents sort of feel that way. And well, we've the got to because they're not having good outcomes. The more, the more you limit the video games and the more you can do, like what you said, is to help socialize people. The more we spend one-on-one -on -one time like you and I have talking to each other face-to-face, -face, yep. the more we all benefit I'm by not, better social skills. I'm not suggesting banning video games, but the rule <laughs> for me was is one hour of TV during the week and two hours on Saturday, two hours on Sunday, so they can do it and that's some. A, and... That's and a great I, way to wrap it up. That, but would, that's great you can't advice. let them play video games for eight hours a day. Well, of course not. Of course not. I think all parents would agree with you. But, but unfortunately, I'm seeing too many kids where that's happening. Okay. Well, it's good advice. It's good advice if you want to be successful in the, the employment industry. The other thing industry. is you've got to expose kids to enough different things. Like how's a kid going to find out he might like acting for a career if there's no school play? How's right. he going to find out he likes uh, oh my fixing gosh. cars if there's no auto shop? They've taken these things out of the schools. I think it's completely wrong. Kids are not getting exposed to enough different things to become careers. Okay. Okay. So lots of exposure. Gosh, thank you so okay. much, Temple. We appreciate thank your time. You. It's been fabulous. Thank you for joining us You're on the welcome. Futures Bright. Welcome back, you guys. For those of you who are watching on Facebook, we were able to put a notice out to you that uh, just as we were about to come back with Anita Lesko, we were asked to evacuate, uh, Trayvon and I, evacuate the studio. And um, so it was uh, a very interesting thing. As we were evacuated, we had to come back up the stairs. I'm completely out of breath and exhausted, but we are back. We're okay, and that's the most important thing. And better than anything, we have Anita Lesko joining us on the phone. As I was saying to you before, Anita Lesko, one of our favorite guests on the show. Um, and Anita, while we were away for the, the, you know, the evacuation, I don't know whether it was a drill, we were playing uh, one of our favorite interviews with a good friend of yours, Dr. Temple Grandin. So, um, but Anita is joining us. She is a wonderful self-advocate. She is a certified nurse. Uh, anesthetist and has been one for over 30 years. She's written many books um, that are just wonderful and informative for the autism community and she has a new topic 
that she has forayed into uh, because of being diagnosed with diabetes and being able to reverse it without medicine. So, Anita, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. We're glad to have you here and glad that you're okay and safe where you are. So, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, type 2 diabetes and what, how many people are affected by this. And, and am I correct that you're telling me that there's a lot more people on the spectrum that are getting diagnosed with type 2 diabetes? Yeah, apparently so. According to the World Health Organization, there's over 422 million people around the world with type 2 diabetes. That's a whole lot. In yeah. the United States alone, one in every three persons is affected by it, and it's classified as the seventh leading cause of death in this country. Those numbers are pretty scary. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I just wrote an article for Autism Asperger's Digest, and I was doing some research through the article and come across uh, numerous articles that are stating that there's a, a very strong uh, link between uh, autism and type 2 diabetes, and the incidences are rapidly growing in this population, not only of um, adults, but also of young kids, teens, and young adults. You know, like type 2 diabetes years ago used to be called adult onset diabetes and it was typically diagnosed in people over the age of 45 now with uh, obesity going rampant um you know especially in the united states all the fast food everywhere and people's lifestyles you're seeing type 2 diabetes in the young kids but i mean let's go back up a second obesity i mean as a as an anesthesia provider um i've seen patients that are 12 years old that weigh 250 pounds you know, mom and dad is sitting there, well, you know, Johnny only likes, you know, mac and cheese and um, cheeseburgers. Well, well, Johnny doesn't go out and buy the groceries all by himself, you know, so it, it has to start somewhere. But that's what's happening. And diabetes, well, it was once thought of as a progressive disease that's there's no cure for. And, you know, people take the drugs that kind of, I, I consider taking the drugs it kind of helps the situation but you're not addressing the actual root problem of diabetes you know they used to think that like diabetes is caused just by you know high sugar diet high carbohydrate diet and all that which in fact that's not really the cause at all and i was very very fortunate i've spent two over well i say nearly two years trying to find a natural cure for type 2 diabetes because after i got diagnosed the primary care doctor that I was going to, you know, I ended up in the emergency room. My blood sugar was over 500. My A1C was 12.4. That was like, like catastrophic. So of course, a couple of days later, I follow up with my primary care doctor who pr pr prescribes all the traditional medications. He, he sends me home a prescription for metformin, glipizide, some regular insulin, the needles and everything to go with it, and, and tells me to eat like a keto diet, stay away from sugar, of course, anything with sugar, and very, very minimal carbohydrates. So it was like a keto type diet, high in animal products. Well, uh, and exercise 30 minutes a day. So as I instantly found out, um, I mean, my whole entire life, I'm super, super sensitive to any kind of medication. Uh, and, and I found that most people on the autism spectrum uh, have that same issue. Well, I found out very rapidly I cannot take any of those pills uh, because they made such horrible side effects. I was really unable to go to work like that. Well, I can't just sit home being sick from taking all my pills, which actually made me even more sick than the diabetes itself. So I spent all this time trying to find a natural cure. And I would go back to this doctor and say, isn't there anything, isn't there anything a natural way to do it, nope, 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 diabetes, it's worse than cancer, at least some cancers, there's a cure for, this is just a progressive disease, there's no cure for it, so, you know, go home and take your pills, I don't care if you have side effects, just go home and take your pills and eat your your, your meat and your chicken and, and all that. Well, that wasn't working for me, and I mean, I got my A1C down to, at one point, I got down like 8.9, but my blood sugars would hover around 250. Well, that's not good. That's way, 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 still way too high. So this past May, uh, and one of the anesthesiologists I work with, some it, it, long story short, he hooks me up with his sister, who's an emergency room physician at the very same hospital I work at. 
And, and she does that, but on the side, her big passion is the whole food plant-based diet, So, which I knew nothing about until May the 13th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, to be exact. So she has me come over to her house to, to talk to me about all this. And so she starts showing me, you know, she has her laptop open. She starts showing me all this information about the whole food plant-based diet, how it can reverse diabetes, can reverse cardiovascular disease, um, inflammatory diseases, even cancer, and all this research that, that backs it all up and all these top doctors that's involved in it. Well, the one doctor in particular, she, she hands me a book, and it's by Dr. Neil Barnard, and it's how to reverse diabetes without drugs. Well, my face lit up like a Rockefeller Center Christmas tree when I saw that book, and I realized this is the answer that I've been looking for, praying for, and, and all of that. So that day, when I came home from there, I came in the house and said to my husband, Abraham, who's also on the autism spectrum, and I said, we're, we're going on this whole, or I said, I'm going on this whole food plant-based diet, and I, I, I briefly explained to him what it is. It means basically you're eating whole grains, no kind of processed food whatsoever, and zero animal products. So we're talking no meat, no chicken, no pork, no fish, no eggs, milk, yogurt, cream, butter, nothing, and also not even any oils, like no olive oil, no canola oil, no avocado oil, nothing. And so he looked at me for a second or two, and he says, well, well, I'm doing it too. Hmm. So I said, okay. I said, well, here's what we have to do. So I said, look, I said, get the trash can and pull it over to the refrigerator, gut out the refrigerator, any everything that wasn't, wasn't going to be on this plan. So by the time it all got said and done, so... We're standing there, you know, I kept hearing clunk, clunk, clunk as we're throwing everything into, into the trash can, um, including, you know, the, in the freezer, there was New York strip steaks. Uh, we had some, actually, we had some Alaskan king crab legs because um, we're, we're celebrating something that weekend. I kind of did look at those for a second. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, my God, I threw them in the trash can. Wow. And at first I said, maybe we should take them across the street to the neighbors. And he looks at me and says, why would you, he said, this is all inflammatory stuff. Why do you want to go inflict it on them? I said, you're right. Never mind. So left it in trash can. So we started that day. Well, by the second, third day, I'm already starting to feel considerably better. And I started checking my blood sugars literally 10 or 15 times a day. I mean, we're talking literally every, every hour and a half, every two hours, before meals, after meals, and in between and everything. So by the second, third day, my blood sugar is starting to come down. I'm starting to feel a whole lot better. By the second week, from checking my blood sugar before all this, it'd be, you know, 289, and all of a sudden it's 72. Hmm. That's normal. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't believe this. I was sticking my fingers so many times. They were, they were so sore I could hardly even touch anything because I just kept doing the finger chick thing, you know, because I couldn't believe it. I even went out and got another AccuCheck machine because I'm like, okay, maybe this one's, there's something wrong with it. No, it was fine. It was really true. Now I'm into, into the sixth month. Um, my diabetes is totally gone. My blood sugars are consistently normal. I still check it uh, probably about eight times a day. Totally normal. Um, in, the, in the process, about a couple weeks ago, I started recognizing that I'd go to get up out of the chair or out of the bed, and I'm like, I feel like I'm dizzy and I pass out. I'm like, what the heck is wrong? Well, I was so focused on diabetes, I kind of forgot to be checking my blood pressure also because I've had high blood pressure for, I don't know, gosh, 10 years now. I've been on a beta blocker. So I check my blood pressure. It's like 88 over 42. And I'm like, holy Christmas, my blood pressure, high blood pressure has gone too. So does so that mean you're off the beta? I myself off of the blood pressure pills, and my blood pressure is staying on like 115 over 65. My heart rate is 65. Wow. I have energy like I can't even believe. And another thing that was an added attraction of this whole thing, in which this also started happening right away, was I started losing weight. Now I'm up to 65 pounds wow. less since May the 13th when I started this whole thing. And this is typical of going on this kind of diet. Now, first thing people want to know, oh, my God, oh, my God, what are you going to eat, a broccoli spear? I mean, what are you going to have? Well, there's so much, you know, I had to, had to go and get, like, a little library of, of cookbooks that go along with this. I mean, Dr. Barnard himself, 
in his first, in the book that about reversing diabetes without drugs, he has quite a number of recipes in there. Then he has a a companion book about the cookbook for reversing diabetes, and there's oh gosh, I know a couple hundred recipes in there, and all these other um, positions and things to do with the whole food plant based diet. Delicious food, international cuisine. It's a whole different lifestyle, and but then that's what it is. It's not like a diet because. I've been on every diet in my lifetime trying to lose weight. I mean, I've been on Jenny Craig. I've done Weight Watchers. I've done, you know, you name it, any diet that there's ever been, nothing ever worked. And I can't I can't tolerate, like, portion control or, right, you know, uh, a thimble full of food, basically, as I call it, you know, or some little itsy-bitsy little, the, those little TV dinner, frozen dinner trays that has, like, four ounces of food. I'm not, I'm not going to last on that. On this lifestyle, I can eat whatever I want, when I want, and as much as I want, and you still lose weight because all this food is uh, it's, it's very high in fiber. It's, high, it's very nutrient-dense. Um, people wonder, oh, where's, where's my protein going to come from? Plants have protein. We do eat tofu as part of our regimen, not necessarily every day, but we'll have it. But in beans, all different kind of beans, and you learn about all these different things, chickpeas, black beans, all these things, and you can make Mexican dishes or Thai dishes for last night for dinner. We had pad thai. Okay, so I mean, it, the, the food is incredible. And then just man, it, eating as much as you want, all you want, and still losing weight. It's kind of like it's kind of like a little party, as we call it. You know, every time we'll go once a week, we weigh ourselves. Abraham has lost about 50 pounds already. And then just the a, a tremendous amount of energy that you have. It's, it's, it's just like unbelievable. Back in October, a month ago, I flew out to Oakland, California, to this uh, international plant-based conference, and I got to meet Dr. Barnard in person. I had written to him about a month earlier, two months earlier before that, and we had been emailing back and forth, and I had asked him could I interview him, and he was very, very gracious and and said yes, so we had set up a time for him that I was going to interview him. And uh, that, that was beyond exciting to me because he's like my superhero. He's basically saved my life with his book. And, his, he, and, and he, his book actually came out in 2006 after he had done years of all this research that was funded by the National Institute for Health um, about what actually is causing diabetes. How can you stop it? How can you reverse it? Um, it's not actually to do anything with carbohydrates and sugar. On a microcellular level, they actually found using MRI spectrometry or all this whatever fancy technology they used, they were able to see inside cells and see that little microscopic fat globules are inside the cell, blocking the entryway where insulin carries glucose molecules inside the cell. So because of the fat that's in your cells, the glucose, the insulin cannot take your the, the glucose molecules in there, so it floats around your bloodstream, wrecks havoc on all your internal organs and vascular system, and just can't get in there. So, you, so then all the symptoms of the type two diabetes happen. Well, when you go on the whole food plant based diet and you're not getting any any of the fats uh, from animal protein, that all gets cleared out, starts getting cleared out literally within days, and then all of a sudden. Your insulin is working just fine and starts to be able to get that glucose in your cell. So it's getting the low in your blood glucose levels that in the glucose is getting inside your cells, providing you with energy that you never had before. So it's like, I mean, to me, this guy is like, you know, just a superhero. Hmm. You know, most superheroes have wear a cape. He wears a white lab coat. But meeting him in person, I can remember I was in this room at the hotel, I had it set up like a little studio with a, my camera, and I brought umbrella lights and all the whole nine yards to do the interview. And he was supposed to show up at 2.30 and went, or 3.30. When I heard a knock on the door right at 3.30, I, when I went to open the door, I nearly dropped dead. And there he is standing there, and I, I, I almost like felt like I was going to just faint to see him in person because this was like the guy who saved my life. Um, and he has, uh, and he's in Washington, D.C., and back in 1980, it was 1984, I think, he started this organization called the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine.org. 
and it's grown into this huge thing. And he has the Barnard Medical Center, and he runs his center. Uh, this is the model that, that every doctor needs to have, literally not just in this country, you know, but, but worldwide, how to deal with the patients uh, with the diabetes to make this whole food plant-based diet the first plan of action that's offered to patients. Um, and like he says, of course, the doctor cannot have the time to sit there, explain the whole thing, but he has a whole army of people that do that. He spends, the, you know, 10 minutes with the patient and all the lab work and things to determine, yes, they really have diabetes or heart disease or whatever. And then they go on to the next person. Then, I mean, these patients are there literally for almost like the whole day learning about what is the whole food plant-based diet? How do you, how do you do it? How do you cook like this? So then by the end of the day, the whole, the person has a total grasp of this thing and they're the ones who can make the decision. Do they want to take that route or do they want to go on the pills and, and insulin and do all that, which then they're just going to basically keep that disease process going forever. Or do they want to do the whole food thing, take control of their health and, and totally turn their whole life around. So I've, um, I've written a book based on my personal journey and the dire need for all physicians to learn about this because that most doctors, majority of doctors have no training at all in nutrition or the plant-based diet or anything. And they need to learn this. They need to be able to offer it to their patients so and to the people who have diabetes to make them learn that there's something that they can do to take total train, you know, charge of their health and their whole entire life. So, I'm hoping this book is going to be released probably somewhere near around Thanksgiving, possibly on wow. Black Friday. Okay, that's very we'll quick. See. So, Anita, so obviously if we're interested in knowing more about this, and I think that there are probably a lot of moms like me that are having these same struggles and issues, so I think there will be a great deal of interest in this. Where, so wh where will the book be coming out so that we can, is there a pre-order available now? Uh, yeah, well, okay, and so my, my website that's being totally revamped, I was hoping it was going to be ready by today, but it, but it needs about two or three more days. The folks that are working on it um, are tweaking it up. So I'm hoping by the end of this week, my website, which is anilesco.com, which right now, if you go on that, it's it's going to be the, the all kind of black and gray autism thing. It's being totally revamped with this new whole food plant-based theme um, and, and it will be real, very obvious it's, it's totally different in the book. You know, it, you'll be able to pre-order it there. Um, and it's going to be sold through Amazon and, you know, the typical way to get it. But, um, and I like people to connect with me, send me, send me emails. You know, I, I'm on this mission to the World Health Organization says by 2025, they want to put an end to the global diabetes epidemic and, and obesity epidemic. Well, I want to be the, the one out in the front uh, taking it all down. And and I'm hoping that's the goal of this book, to get people following my footsteps, take control of their health, get rid of it. Even if people just want to lose weight, you go on this way of eating, you will lose weight very rapidly and get into the best health you've ever been in. Well, and that's, I, you know, we all want that. Uh, so I know I had had the opportunity to talk to you, and I ran out. I could only get the cookbook uh, from Dr. Bernard, uh, but I got the cookbook, and I was amazed at some of the recipes in there and uh, bought a couple of the things that I'd never heard of before because I didn't know about, I knew about coconut aminos, but there is a different kind of coconut that's a syrup um, that, that I went and got. Uh, but I, ha I, I have to admit that I looked at some of the recipes and then I didn't take action. And this is an action thing. So, but I didn't know the part about the oil. I, you can take meat away from me. I'm already dairy free. So, uh, you know, that's, that's fine. And you can take, I was a, a vegetarian and a vegan for many years. So you can take meat away from me. That's not a problem. But the oil, uh, that's where I go, uh-oh, because I have a significant amount of olive oil, and I was thinking that that was a plant-based thing, but we, we can't have it because it's processed? Is that the deal? That's correct. I mean, you can have a couple of olives, because that's only a couple of olives. I, I like in a tablespoon of olive oil, I know there's like a thousand olives or something, whatever it is that goes into that, plus it's processed. And there's a Dr. Caldwell Esselstein. There's a, a, a documentary called Forks Over Knives, 
and uh, Dr. Esselstein is on the forefront, the cutting edge of that whole the whole thing of, with cardiovascular heart disease. And he he's uh, totally totally against you know he's into the whole food plant based thing, but also with the, with the he's the one who mostly stresses about the no oils because any of these oils, olive oil, coconut oil, any any of those they they cause inflammation of the inner lining of your heart called the endothelial cells, oh, man. and that's a proven research documented thing. Okay, well, I'm on that now. But so how do you have pad thai? Aren't the noodles processed? Okay, pad thai is the, the, the brown rice noodles that the only ingredient is brown rice and water in the box. Okay. Now, that, that's, that's something I own. We, we probably only eat that once a month. It's not something we're going to eat every day. Got it. We okay. eat uh, uh, the, the um, and I, say, I, I refer to it as kind of the hardcore the way Dr. Barnard eats kind of thing. You know, we might have miso soup uh, sometimes on the weekends for breakfast with tofu and bok choy in it. Yeah. Um, that might be, for, but basically breakfast will be the, the old-fashioned rolled oats, the kind you actually have to cook. Yeah. Um, a teaspoon of cinnamon in it, uh, a cut-up apple and a cut-up banana, and it's this big, huge bowl of oatmeal that, that takes you like half an hour practically to eat it because it's so much. That's going to be breakfast basically every day. Got it. Now, people want to know, how in the God's earth do you saute onions or garlic or anything without oil? Yeah. Okay, so what do you do? You chop up your onion, and you, you get your skillet, your nonstick skillet, and first you put it on the stove and get it hot for two minutes. You actually set a timer, two minutes, get it hot. Then you throw your onions in there, and they're going to start sizzling, spattering, and when they start, and you start mixing them all around, and when they start looking like they might be wanting to go on the verge of getting, you know, sticking on the pan or, or whatever, you get like a teaspoon, tablespoon of, um, I use spring water out of a bottle or something, and I throw in a tablespoon of water. Okay. And it'll sizzle and everything, and you keep doing that as needed, and then when you saute, finish sauteing, the onions are brown and caramelized, and they will actually taste the same as if you did it in oil. Okay. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. And you can't deny the results that she's getting, uh, which is pretty incredible. So, Anita, we're looking forward to this uh, book that you're going to have out. And please let us know at Autism Live so that we can reconnect with you and tell a launch date and when that's coming out. People could, can still go to anitalesco.com, but you're not going to see all the information about this for at least another couple of days. I just, uh, I'm, I'm so happy for you, and I'm so happy that you're feeling better, and I'm going to be following in your snowshoes uh, so that I can get there, too. And, and thank you for this wonderful information. Um, for, but the one thing I'm going to say to you, Anita, that I want to, because you talked about the nonstick pan, I hope you're talking about like a cast iron pan and not like a Teflon thing, because... Because that can also, um, we've, we've had experts on the show talking about the nonstick thing is not, not the best, that we're, we're advocating people use cast iron, and you can do the same thing that she was talking about with cast iron. It's actually easier cleanup than, than the Teflon kind of thing. Um, I didn't want to let that bypass, because that, you have... Actually, there's the, the, new, the new, new things called, I think it's called uh, Green Pan. It's a ceramic nonstick pan that actually, if you read about it, they're the safest things Okay, um, cool. It's totally different than a like a traditional nonstick Teflon pan. Right. Yeah, I know what you mean. I don't don't use those anymore for yeah. years. But these uh, ceramic, uh, it probably costs those. about twenty five dollars for a big twelve inch skillet. There we go. The ceramic is good. Wonderful. So, Anita, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for letting us uh, be a little bit late because of our evacuation. And we're like I said, I'm following your footsteps and. And we're all paying attention, and this is important information that you just gave us. All righty. Well, you have a great day. You too. Have a wonderful day Alrighty. with your wonderful husband. All righty. Okay, all right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. So we're running very behind, and we're hopeful that Anita, uh, that not, we just met with Anita Lesko. We want to make sure that Christina Adams is still available, because I know she had a bunch of interviews, and now I'm suddenly worried about that. Stick with us. We're going to be right back, hopefully, with Christina Adams.
Hard times lead to good choices. Many times you're going to find out that change is coming and it's not something that you like to see. Things sometimes just don't work. Sometimes you have to put your child in a new school. Sometimes you have to put them in a different classroom. Often you'll see this with perhaps special education versus regular education or everyone's favorite, puberty. All bets are off then. However, these things happen when they need to happen. So making that hard choice is super, super scary. But when you open those doors to look at things that maybe you've never dreamed you would have to look at, you're going to find help that you never expected. There are a lot of people out there dealing with the same things that you are dealing with, and there is a level of help that you never even knew existed. So don't be afraid when it's time to look at the scary problems that you're having. When those things come up, when the aggression increases, when things are falling apart at home, when you're getting the calls from the schools, don't be afraid. Reach out. Find out what you need to do. You might need to look at new schools, new housing. You might need to access new levels of service. But I am telling you, you're going to see amazing things. There are children that, as they grow, do things with the help of others, very specialized support that you never thought they could do. So once you do that and you meet the child where he or she is and you give them what they need, everybody can do better and you're going to see amazing progress. Welcome back. So we're leaving Christina Adams to go to Christina Adams. Uh, she is joining us right now via Skype. And uh, if you watch this show, you know I'm a big fan of Christina Adams. Her book, A Real Boy, was the path that led me to get started at CARD and helped us to get to the intervention that we got to. And she's an amazing woman. We do a whole series with her here on the show uh, that's called Autism and Beyond. You just watched one of those episodes. And there she is. Welcome to the show again, Christina. Hello, Shannon and everyone. I just love being with you. Well, we love having you here. And the first big news is, you know, forever, I know I was one of the people saying, when's the next book? When is the next book? And, uh, you know, you were amassing your information until it was a time that was ready, but your next book is out. Have you got one there you can hold up? I do. I did it. I had to listen to you. So here it is. Camel Crazy, a quest for miracles in the mysterious world of camels. There we go. And so if I'm sure that there are some people who are like, huh, what? Hmm? Uh, they thought you were just crazy for camels. But this is the second half of your story uh, about your son and the journey that you were on with him, but not only with him, with all of us and the world, looking at uh, the whole person and the whole body. So uh, as quickly as you can, tell us what we find in the book. Okay, so I got into this whole camel thing because of autism. And as you know, it changes our entire life trajectories. So I had written my first book, A Real Boy, which is all about my son's early intervention. And then after that, I was at a children's book festival. I saw a guy with a camel. I had the idea that the milk would help my son's autism symptoms, which, as I knew at the time, were connected to his immune functioning. I blew it in from Bedouins in the Desert, frozen bottles of milk, and gave some at bedtime, and he was just so better overnight. And that led me to keep investigating the milk, make ties with the worldwide camel community, uh, help contribute to science, I'm happy to say. And now, globally, kids are drinking it everywhere and getting better. And so the book is all about that journey. But I also was really privileged to um, kind of discover the world of camels and camel caregivers and the amazing people that are out there. And they have a lot of knowledge about natural healing things. And camel milk has been known to be uh, a healing substance for thousands of years. But autism was unknown to them as being affected by camel milk. It was known to anyone, really. So I had the idea. And then along the way, uh, we've been able to build bridges with camel cultures, people in other countries, people in America, because it is available in America. So not only do I tell that story, which is a personal story about kind of evolving, you know, through this world and becoming more uh, able to build bridges with people internationally, which I love. Also, I've got the reasons why camel milk works in here. And also kind of a user's guide in the back what will tell you how it works and how to use it, tips on serving it, what conditions it helps, not just autism, but anything connected to inflammation and gut health, which can include diabetes, uh, Crohn's disease, gastrointestinal skin conditions, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, etc. And then in the very back, because I know this is what you're going to want, where do I get it? And there's a guide to where you can buy it right here, and that means in the United States and across the world. 
Which is amazing because I remember the first time we had you on the show to talk about the camel milk, it, you were still in the stages of trying to get it over here just for your son. You'd gone through some pretty intense uh, things that happened with getting the camel milk over here, which I, I hope that you've detailed in the book and I don't want to give away, but I mean, it plays like a, a, a movie, uh, like the movie of the week, the things. I, I just want to say, did you notice the part where Christina was saying, you know, I was at this book fair and it came to me that maybe camel milk would help. And so then I went about trying to get some camel milk from some Bedouins. And, and I just want to say, Christina, that that is so you, that that's what you decide. Because a lot of us would be like, hmm, camel milk and, and talking to somebody and hearing that it has uh, benefits to camel milk that are very healing and has been considered a healing thing for hundreds of years. But a lot of us would be like, that's fascinating. But I don't know any of us that would be like, let me see if I can call a Bedouin to see if I can get camel milk. Um, but th that's Christina Adams for you. She's a woman on a mission and really nothing could stop her. And it's one of the reasons why I love you because you are amazing. Um, but um, I, I, I just remember that in the, in, the, in the amount of time that we've been talking about this with you on the show, that there was a period of time where people would say, well, where do I get it? And it was a dicey proposition. But now you're at the point where you've got a mainstream book that I expect to be a bestseller, and you've got a part in the back that tells people where to get it. Look at you. Look at how far you have taken this industry. I don't know if it's just a, a foolish or uh, a passion or whatever. I mean, anything to do with camels is tough. Uh, and it's certainly been a tough mission, but there's been enough convincing uh, experience and evidence, which I've been happy to contribute to, that a wonderful publisher was happy to acquire the book. And it's the same publisher that publishes some very famed folks, and I'm honored to be among their their uh, their canon and uh, so it just came out and I hope that people will support it because it's really for you I mean this is this is your your um, kind of I try to put all of our life experiences in this book I'm just one person but you know we all have so many things in common and people don't really hear us or see us once autism hits our life a lot of people write us off our lives get constricted our children's lives are really constricted so I just really want people to be aware. You can you could reach out. You can empower yourself. You can help change things for yourself and others. It may not be the path you expected. Did I expect that somebody would be giving me, a, you know, camel jewelry and things like that? Uh, no, I never did. And here I am surrounded by camels because I wrote a book about uh, them and how they benefit the world. But it is a personal story. There's a lot of drama in here. There's a couple of fun Me Too moments. Not exactly fun, but fun to read. And uh, a couple of really dramatic things where I didn't exactly know what was going to happen to me next. So I hope you'll come along on that. And, of course, you can get it on Amazon.com and any independent bookstore. Anywhere books are sold, they'll order it for you if you go to a bookstore. And international buyers can get it, too, on my website. Christina Adams Author, I have uh, several buttons you can push depending on what you want to do and where you live. And Christina is a beautiful writer. Uh, let's say that first and foremost. She's a beautiful writer. She's got a story to tell. Uh, and she's capable of telling a story and keeping your interest. And uh, But then, the, then hearing about, because we were talking at the beginning of the show, Christina, about the fact that the CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, has already been able to phenotype 17 distinct different subclusters of autism. And, and we know that within those subclusters, it's not one size fits all. And, and all parents are on the mission of trying to figure out what is it that will keep my child healthy, get them and keep them healthy, and then how do I help them to learn the things that they missed while they weren't healthy? And, and it cannot be a one size fits all. So uh, this will be an interesting read and you might find an answer for you and for your child that could make a tremendous difference. Because people have been, uh, you've been traveling the world talking about this for many years now, and people have re reported to you many different stories of their kiddo uh, having their ability to focus improve. What else have you heard from parents? Well, I'm really glad you brought up the subtypes thing because, yeah, I really do have the cutting edge science and information in here, but I weave it in easy to read in the story. So I hope that, you know, people will not look at it as, oh, I've already tried the diet and it didn't work. Oh, I've already done this and that. So as you said, we now know there are different subtypes of autism. There are also different types of gut bacteria that are linked to immune response and affect 
behavior that you know looks like autism type of things. So even if your child, in your mind, is regulated for inflammation and all that, he may not be or she may not be. I thought mine was. I mean, we were under the care of you know doctor, very specialty stuff done on the diet, but it can help even if you don't know it can. And if it doesn't, it's still an awesome milk uh, product because animal milks can help build bone health like vegan milks cannot. And also, as we know, if you have ever tried a rotation diet, some of those um, you know vegan milks can kick off allergies. So uh, I just think that it's good to know that there are things out there that it's worth exploring, it's worth trying. And I do kind of outline why. Uh, I'm very fortunate that we've been endorsed by... Uh, some geneticists, some MD neurologists, uh, National Book Award winners have endorsed the book, Slow Food International. And these are people that have read it and understand what I'm trying to say, that natural, good quality food affects uh, mothers and fathers. When they conceive a baby, that can make a difference. When your child is in the world, these days it's really tough to defend against all the you know, toxins in the environment that are coming at us. But this gives you some techniques on, on how to do that and kind of you know, hopefully it'll give you a story, too, to help just let you know that you're not alone and we are capable of still having a life sometimes with our wonderful children with autism in our lives. Absolutely. Uh, so, again, they can, uh, tell them their website, but you can order it now on Amazon. You could order it now and have the book, um, whether it's ebook or have the book in your hand, probably within the next 24 hours, because that's how Amazon works. But what's your website where they can go and find all the connections to you, Christina? Okay, so ChristinaAdamsAuthor.com is my website. I'm also on Twitter at Christina Think. And I'm also uh, on Facebook at, at Christina Adams Author. But yes, go to Amazon and you can order it very quickly on Kindle. You'll have it right away. You can have it in a day or two if it's the print version. You can go to any bookstore and they'll order it for you. And also you can ask a bookstore or your local library to stock it and carry it. That way it will be out there for other people to get. And if you do read it and you like it, I would love for you to put a review on Amazon or Goodreads or Barnes & Noble because just letting other parents and other people know that would be great. And also, I'm happy to report that people with autism have endorsed the book, including Dr. Stephen Shore and uh, the owner of Quiet Calm LLC. They're both people with autism. They both have endorsed the book. And uh, it's just good to know that we're all on the same team of giving people with autism the best chance at their best life. That's pretty remarkable. So I want to pivot now a little bit because you also write, and you write for several different outlets, that um, articles. And you wrote an article the other day that's gotten quite a bit of traction uh, where you were taking issue with being called mom. Now, I know people's immediate reaction is like, excuse me, you don't want to be called mom? Uh, we all like being called mom, except that there are certain times and places where you feel that it's being abused. When do you think it's inappropriate? Well, it's been on my mind for a number of years, having attended IEPs, having attended just the regular child care infrastructure here in California, it's been since birth that people that I don't know didn't give birth to or adopt had call me mom. So in the very beginning when my son was a little baby, it was kind of cute. Oh, mom, come on here, sign on the form, you know, sit down here, do this, do that. It's very endearing. But as the years go on, I've seen mom become a little bit uh, used as a put down or weaponized, especially by people that have a problem with your son's behavior or have a problem with what you're asking for them to pay for in case of school districts. Um, there are some wonderful, wonderful educators and therapists out there, of course, which I've benefited from for my son, and they sometimes call you mom, and they mean it sweetly. So I don't you know, want to hurt them because I think they're wonderful. But there are people that do say it like, well, mom, we don't pay for that in an IEP. And it's just gotten to the point where I feel like that if someone calls you mom or dad, and they don't use your name, and their name is generally right in front of them, either on the pad that you sign into the doctor's office or the child care or, you know, after school care. And they can look down and see your name, but oftentimes they get in the habit of calling you mom, mom, mom. So I almost feel that's a way of kind of like saying, you're a mom, know your place. I don't need to know your contributions, your identity, or your intellect outside of your role as a mother, because that's all you are to me right now. And it's a way to kind of put women in a box, I think. And I'm getting tired of it. So I, I had a lady the other day, 21, uh, you know, like she was got to be maybe 20s or 30s. I've never met this woman. I'm on the phone with her, and she starts calling me mom. And I, I said, well, I hope you don't mind. I would really prefer that you use my name. 
Did it make a difference? No. She kept on calling me mom. So I'm just tired of it. And I, it's a great article. And again, Christina is a wonderful writer. So where can we find the article, Christina? The article is on ravishly.com, which is all about food, I mean, family feelings and uh, modern thinking. So ravishly.com is very uh, up to date on what's going on out there in the world. And I'm really happy to be on it. And uh, it, I do love my son calling me mom, which he does quite often. Yesterday, he was on the phone with my mom saying, you know, mom's new book is out. I'm very proud of her. She's getting up, up early to do all these radio shows. And, and I love when my son calls me mom. But when 40-year-old guys that are uh, trying to not pay for something in a school district sitting call me mom, I don't really care for it. So if you want to join in on that and share it with your local educators in a nice, polite way, go for it, ravishly.com. And I got to say, I, I think everybody should read the article. When Christina first uh, sent it to me and I, and, I, and I was like, well, why wouldn't we all want to be called mom, right? Because I was thinking of those times that you were talking about when we first were called moms. I was very late to the mom game. Um, and we're all very proud. You're, I know you are a super proud mom and are, uh, are not afraid to be called mom in conjunction to your child. But you're right. The more I read on in the examples that you gave, I was like, oh, yeah. And they are using it as a way to put us in our place sometimes. And I think it's very important that we are all hip to that and squash that and keep mom as the wonderful term that is used in conjunction to us being uh, our, the, you know, the person for our kids, not this sort of category where we're demeaning that title. And we all have had that happen from time to time to be reminded, oh, well, you know, I'm the doctor, you're the mom. I'm the teacher, you're the mom. Um, I, 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 my thing that I've said at IEPs a lot is, I'm not only on the team, I'm the most important vote on the team aside from my child, <laughs> right? Because they try to minimize uh, what our role is, and it is our kid. So I, by the time I was done reading, I was all hepped up, uh, to be honest, Christina. I thought, oh, I don't, is it, is it possible that I'm going to disagree with Christina on this? I don't see where she's coming from. And then I read it, and I was like, holy Batman, she's right on this. And it made me start to look at things in a different way, which is always good writing, right? So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you know, you. and basically, if I haven't changed your diaper, don't call me mom. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you have a name, you're a professional, and we all know what the role is. A lot of times it's pure laziness, but I do think that sometimes you're right that it is weaponized, and we should put uh, a, uh, an end to that immediately. So uh, read uh, Christina's article, uh, Ravishingly. It's, it's called Ravishly.com. So you can just Google ravishly.com. Stop calling me mom. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And thank you for being patient and waiting for us while we were um, evacuated. <laughs> we we thank you all because live and Shannon and everyone. Well, thank you so much. And good luck. I can't wait to uh, see more because uh, I'm seeing all the reports coming in from your book and how much people are loving it. And I can't wait to hear when you are officially bestseller. So, oh, well, let's work. To, I need you on the team because this is anything with autism is a little hard to get out there. So uh, if you guys want to help uh, Camel Crazy, uh, Amazon.com, bookstores, libraries, uh, let's let's get that camel over the hump. And, and for our absolutely kids. owe you a review. I will. Get Thank on, you. I will get upon that. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Love you so much. Uh, Love you. I say hi to everybody for us. Bye bye. So that's two amazing women. And notice that, you know, some of the things, you know, Anita's saying no animal products, and then, and then Christina is saying camel products. And so you need to know that there are times when one diet is going to work for one person, and another diet is going to work for another person. So uh, you, you, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We give you the information, and then you need to decide for yourself what's right for you, what's right for your child, right? Um, because I don't know which one of those subtypes you are in or your child is in. All right. Uh, we are well past time. We've gone way over because we uh, let uh, the Temple Grandin article run during the evacuation. We are going to be back tomorrow with the best of. You very likely will see some more Temple Grandin tomorrow. Then I want to tell you who else we have on the show. I always have to shuffle my papers to find. Um, I don't have it. I don't know. 
Uh, we've got big shows this week, but we're out of time. We'll figure that out for you. Check out the postcard. If you haven't already subscribed, the way that you can know who's going to be on every single week is if you subscribe. So when you're on our page, autism-live.com, within seven seconds, a little pop-up will come up and it will ask you to subscribe. What you do is that every week you get a little viewer guide that tells you who's going to be on that week so that you're in the know and you know what's planned. Um, who's going to be on. We don't spam you with a bunch of other stuff. We just send that once a week. Here's your viewer guide, and there you go. All right. Uh, I will see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.